morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you are listening. Thank you so very much for making me a part of your day. My name is Lee Parm. You might know me as Lego Lee or Lego Lee329 from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, you name it. I am all over the internet, and this is the Brickology Podcast, the study of small plastic bricks. How are you doing today? I sincerely hope you are doing well, and welcome to the season three premiere of Brickology and episode. 23, the Jordan episode of Brickology overall. Thank you guys so much for helping me get here. We are now two seasons into Brickology and season three has begun and this season is going to be bigger and better than ever. I have a lot of great stuff planned for this season. I hope you guys are excited for the future of this podcast. The podcast will continue with weekly episodes. They are all scheduled. I have a whole schedule laid out. Now, the There might be something that comes up in the future that I don't know about right now that will push back an episode or delay something. I can't guarantee you every episode will come out every Friday, but the plan is for right now, every Friday, new episodes of Brickology. And one little thing, I also have another podcast in development. It's not going to be Lego-centric, but I have another podcast in the works. So I can't say anything else about it right now, but stay tuned for a new podcast announcement coming at some point here in the near future. And also... I hit over 6,000 streams of Brickology, and I believe last week I talked about how I just hit 5,000 streams. So the streams are going super, super well, and thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. And if you really want to continue to support me, go find me online. I had to do my shameless plug for my various social media sites. You can like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter, especially follow me on Instagram. I post daily content over there. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel where I post reviews of LEGO videos, and I post all the podcasts in video format as well. I just started reviewing some of the Lego Super Mario stuff. Really exciting. You can also catch those reviews on my IGTV. And if you really love Lego Lee, if you really love Brickology, maybe consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Literally giving me like $1 a month goes a long way to supporting my accounts and all that I am doing here. So if you really love me, maybe consider subscribing or supporting me on Patreon. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the topic for this week's episode of Brickology. And if you're a long-standing fan of the show, you know that my season one premiere, the premiere episode, first ever episode of this podcast, was about Lego Star Wars episode one sets from The Phantom Menace. The premiere for season two was stuff from Lego Star Wars episode two, Attack of the Clones. Now, I mixed up the chronological order because I did the Clone Wars episode, episode four, Brickology, which is still to this day my most streamed episode of this podcast, but I did the Clone Wars episode episode when the Clone Wars new season came out back in February. So I had to mix it up a little bit and I kind of broke the chronological order there. But since then, we've been doing Star Wars episodes in chronological order that they happen in the films and TV shows. So we're going to continue on in chronological order. I do wish that I had, you know, already done the episode three episodes. So I could continue saying the premiere of season three is Star Wars episode three, but I already did the episode three episode last season. So that means the next film in chronological order for Star Wars is Solo, a Star Wars story. So the next few Star Wars episodes of Brickology are going to be kind of those weird bridges between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. So we're going to do Solo, we'll be doing Rogue One, and Star Wars Rebels. So those are going to be the next few episodes for Brickology themed on Star Wars. And like the last two seasons, there will be two Star Wars episodes, a season of Brickology. I know Star Wars makes up a big chunk of my fan base. So I think doing 20% total of my episodes of Brickology about Star Wars is fair. I don't want to do too much Star Wars. This is a Lego podcast. It's not a Star Wars podcast. So I don't want to spam too much Star Wars, but there will be two Star Wars episodes of Brickology this season. And that means we have to start today with talking about stuff based off the Lego sets, based off the movie Solo, A Star Wars Story. Before I get started, I apologize if the air conditioning is making way too much background noise. Normally, I turn off the AC while recording Brickology because I don't want there to be background noise, but it's literally like 98 degrees outside right now. Turning off the AC means I'd probably be melting during this episode of Brickology, so the AC will stay on. Hopefully, I can edit that out, but there might be a little too much background noise. 
noise for this week's episode. But without further ado, let's start talking about the history of Solo a Star Wars Story. On Brickology, I always do this. I give little history lessons about what I'm about to talk about. And of course, Star Wars has lots of history. Every Star Wars film has a ton of stuff that goes into the film getting produced. But no Star Wars film, in my opinion, has quite the history Solo a Star Wars Story does. This movie's history is so bizarre and weird and different and I'm excited to talk about it and kind of tell this story from my perspective and some of the mistakes that were made that ended up in this movie being somewhat of a disaster from certain points of view. So let's talk about that right now. We'll start off by talking about Disney buying Lucasfilm in 2012. Obviously, I think all of us knew that happened. Disney spent, I think, like over $4 billion paying George Lucas for Lucasfilm, and they announced that they're gonna make new Star Wars movies, a new Star Wars trilogy, starting in 2015. Now, speaking of 2015, that was the year that they also announced that they were gonna make spin-off Star Wars movies. They announced, I believe it was like March of 2015. I remember I was on spring break when they announced it. So it was March 2015, they announced they're gonna do the these spin-off films and they announced that the first spin-off film was going to be Rogue One about, you know, stealing the Death Star plans. The Rogue One episode of Brickology will occur in the future that should be, if I'm following the correct pattern, the season four premiere of Brickology. So we won't talk much about Rogue One today. But Rogue One was the first ever Star Wars movie that wasn't part of a trilogy. It was its own standalone story. They since gave them the subtitle, A Star Wars Story, Kind of a weird thing. I'm not really sure why they chose that particular vernacular for it. It sounds very odd if you ask me, but that's just what they call them. So it's Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And they announced a couple years later that the next Star Wars story would be Solo, a Star Wars story. Technically speaking, the name for Solo wasn't announced until like late 2017, early 2018, if I'm remembering correctly, but we knew we were getting a Han Solo spin-off prequel film about a young Han Solo in his early 20s before the events of the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy. Now the development of Solo is really weird. This is a very complicated history that I'm about to get into. So Solo, the directors they hired to make this movie were Phil Lord and Chris Miller, a directing duo. Now, if you recognize those names, even if you're not you know, a big movie fan, you don't follow this sort of thing, you might recognize those names as a Lego fan because these are the guys that directed and wrote the original Lego movie. The Lego movie from 2014 was made by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. They also did Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs in like 2009, I believe. They did 21 and 22 Jump Street in 2012 and 2014, respectively. And they're also heavily involved with the more recent Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So these guys know what they're doing. I would say that they're geniuses. Fun little fact, I believe it was Phil Lord actually went to college at Dartmouth, which is an Ivy League school, very good school, with my high school pre-calculus teacher. Weird fun fact, so Phil Lord went to college with one of my teachers from high school. Tangent over, these guys are really good directors and really gifted writers. Now, they were more known for comedy and doing things that are kind of zany and a lot of animated stuff as well. They weren't really known for their live action stuff, but even though, you know, I mean, they did do 21, 22 Jump Street, but those are raunchy comedies. But even though they weren't really super experienced in the field of doing like a blockbuster movie like Star Wars, I was still super hyped that they were announced as the directors for this movie because one, the Lego movie is one of my like top 20 favorite movies of all time. Every other movie they've done has been good. Like pretty much every project they touch seems to be really good. And I had utmost faith that these two were gonna make a great film. And then in 2017, it was like, I think July, um, summer 2017, at some point, Phil Lord and Chris Miller got fired from directing Solo, A Star Wars Story. Now, directors getting fired off movies is not super weird. 
it happens a decent bit, especially with blockbuster style films. Star Wars has had a lot of directors get fired. Gareth Edwards reportedly kind of got fired midway through production of Rogue One. They fired Colin Trevorrow from directing Episode 9. They also fired Josh Trank from doing one of the spin-off movies. I mean, Star Wars has fired a lot of directors under Disney's regime and Kathleen Kennedy as president. That's a whole nother thing that could probably make an entire episode of this about just complaining about how horrible Star Wars is produced right now. But Phil Lord and Chris Miller, they were fired. And you know, it's one thing, like Colin Trevorrow was fired, but he was fired before production of episode nine even began. He was working on a script and he was fired a few years in advance. It wasn't like a huge deal that he was fired. Phil Lord and Chris Miller were reportedly 80% 80% of the way through filming Solo A Star Wars Story and were less than a year removed from the release date in 2018 and they're fired. Now that is very bizarre. That does not happen usually. And usually if you're that far into production, you just finish production you either bite the bullet and keep the directors on for the rest of production and just kind of cut ties with them afterwards, or you have like a second unit director or somebody step in briefly and finish up the scenes and then you just, you know, kind of cut your losses and release that. That's not what they did with Solo, A Star Wars Story. They actually hired veteran director Ron Howard. Now, Ron Howard, he's made some bad movies here and there, but he's also, you know, he won an Oscar for directing A Beautiful Mind. He did Apollo 13. He did a movie called Rush from 2013, which is about Formula and Racing starring Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Bruhl. That is a fabulous movie. If you have not seen Rush, I would highly recommend watching that film. Ron Howard is a seasoned veteran director. So they hired Ron Howard to direct the rest of Solo, but they did some major reshoots on Solo, and I believe something like 85% or so of the movie was ultimately reshot, and Ron Howard actually got full directing credit for Solo. Lord and Miller were still listed in the credits as writers for the film, but ultimately, Ron Howard was the only person credited as a director for Solo A Star Wars Story. I know there's a weird thing with like the film association where you have to direct a certain percentage of a movie to get full directing credit, and Ron Howard did that amount of Solo. And the reasons Lord and Miller were fired were apparently they're making it too funny, it was going off the rails, and the way they're directing Alden Ehrenreich, who stars as Han Solo in the film, which just wasn't working and people hated it and it was terrible. I don't know how much of that is true. I would have loved to have seen their version of the film. The version we got, I'll talk about here in just a second, was still pretty good, but ultimately it was just kind of this weird cluster for Solo, and it was a very troubled production. And now let's jump forward to the release of the movie in May of 2018. So like I just said, Solo was released in May. Now, May was the original release month for Star Wars. The original six Star Wars movies were all released around the same time in May, usually around Memorial Day weekend. However, after a delay for Episode 7, Disney decided to release Episode 7 in December of 2015. Then Rogue One and Episode 8 also came out in December, and they were making billions of dollars on each film. December was turning out to be a very profitable release date for Star Wars. Star Wars, but Solo went back to Star Wars roots and was released in, on May, in May of 2018, so the first film since Episode 3 to be released in May. And that also means that we had two Star Wars movies released in theaters in a six month time frame because The Last Jedi was released in December of 2017, just six months earlier. And of course, The Last Jedi is a very infamous movie. Someday I'll do an episode about Lego Star Wars and The Last Jedi and I'll give my full thoughts on that film then. The Last Jedi obviously wasn't super well received by Star Wars fans. And I think people had the combination of The Last Jedi wasn't good and were kind of fatigued of so much Star Wars content that there was definitely a Star Wars fatigue going into Solo and it came out very soon after The Last Jedi. And then Disney approached marketing for Solo very strangely. 
they made a decision that they did not want the marketing for The Last Jedi and for Solo to overlap. Which one doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because Disney has all these Marvel movies that always have marketing that overlap with one another. So I'm not really sure what their thought process was there. But they didn't market Solo until The Last Jedi had come out and was pretty much out of theaters. The first trailer for Solo was not released until Super Bowl Sunday in 2018. This was a full three and a half months, just three and a half months before the release of the film. To put that into perspective, the first trailer for The Last Jedi came out in April of 2017, about eight months before that movie was released. This is kind of ridiculous to me. It seems like they easily could have made a trailer for Solo and attached that to The Last Jedi, which could have, you know, you know marketed it with all the people who've seen The Last Jedi and would have been a full six months before the movie comes out. And I think most people understand that Solo is a prequel not connected to The Last Jedi in really any way. So I don't really understand the thought process there. But all of these components that I talked about, troubled production, weird marketing, release, Star Wars fatigue, last shit it just wasn't very good, came together and made Solo a Star Wars story a humongous box office bomb. This movie made less than $400 million worldwide on a budget of about $200 million. And the way that movies make is usually it's considered you need to double up your budget to break even with this kind of film because of all the money they spend on marketing and things of that sort. So ultimately, Solo lost Disney a ton of money. It's a huge box office bomb. And Disney kind of lost their confidence in the Star Wars spin-offs after this. They've actually canceled pretty much any future of Star Wars story films because of how badly Solo bombed. That's a real thing. They had a movie, James Mangold was producing or directing, supposed to direct a Boba Fett movie that was announced and there's also an Obi-Wan movie that's now been turned into a Disney Plus show, or so we're still kind of getting that. But all of these reported spin-offs have just been canceled because of how badly Solo performed. And the Solo toys also performed pretty poorly as well. They sat on shelves, people weren't buying them, they weren't super popular, and that includes the Lego sets. The Lego sets didn't sell super well, they're never super hard to find, and you can probably still find them at some local places as well. And we might not ever see more sets from this film. Like, for real, this might be the only time we ever see Solo sets. I could see Lego remaking something Something like the Kessel Run Millennium Falcon at some point in the future, but for the time being, we're not going to get any more solo sets or products based off Solo, a Star Wars story. And before I talk about the sets, I think I should share my own personal opinions on the film. I went into this movie because of all the production issues with very low expectations. My expectations were incredibly incredibly tampered because of all the issues. I had very low anticipation for this movie, and the movie was definitely better than I thought. I saw it four times in theaters, and it was a really enjoyable movie, a very entertaining Star Wars story. And I was really impressed with Alden Ehrenreich, the star of the movie who played Han Solo. I mean, this guy had to step into the shoes of one of the most iconic characters in film history, played by Harrison Ford. And one does not simply replace Harrison Ford. He didn't replace Harrison Ford. He will never be as good as Harrison Ford. But he was able to capture the essence of the Han Solo character all while not doing a Harrison Ford impression. I was really impressed with Alden Ehrenreich's performance in this film. I was also impressed with the plot. It was a fun heist plot with a lot of really cool scenes and overall an enjoyable movie. I had some issues with the film, the lighting in the movie, Ron Howard is kind of known for some dim lighting and he kind of brought that to this film as well. The lighting is really bad. It's like literally just hard to see some of the things that are happening in the scenes. I also was not a big fan of Donald Glover's Lando. I love Donald Glover. I recently have been watching the show Community. Donald Glover is great in that show. Although to me, Donald Glover's performance as Lando, this is kind of a hot take. Most people disagree with this opinion, but he seemed like he was doing a Billy D. Williams impression and not really bringing his own flair to the character. So 
show, I personally didn't love Donald Glover's performance in this film, and his droid sidekick L3 is one of the most annoying droids and just characters in all of Star Wars. I thought she was pretty awful, and then the movie had some dumb things to explain things. You know how kind of like people didn't like the explanation for the forest being midichlorians in the prequels? The way they explained things, like Han Solo's name, was so stupid. That was just so, so dumb. There were some really eye-rolling moments like that in the film. So, not every time the movie was great, but overall, I think it was an enjoyable movie and a solid Star Wars story, and definitely not offensively bad, and I don't think it deserved to bomb in the way it did. But those are my personal thoughts about Solo and the history of Solo out of the way. We can now finally jump in to talking about the Lego sets based off this film. So Lego released five sets based off Solo in April of 2018, about a month before the movie was officially released. Now, for the previous three Disney Star Wars movies and for The Rise of Skywalker last year, they did these big launches and events they called Force Friday, where stores opened up at midnight, you could go to the store and get at this stuff at first on Force Friday. That did not happen for Solo. Disney didn't seem to care. They didn't market the Solo toys at all. There was no Force Friday. There was nothing special about the release of these Solo toys. It was very unceremonious. And the wave is kind of small. It's a very interesting wave. Five sets, and a lot of the sets are very small sets, and we'll talk about them here now. The first set from Solo a Star Wars Story we'll talk about is the Imperial Patrol Battle Pack. I find it very interesting there was a battle pack in this wave. They've done a battle pack for every new Star Wars movie. That's just kind of tradition at this point. However, the battle packs for all the other movies has been in a follow-up second wave. But the first wave for Solo got a battle pack. This was a $15 set that had 99 pieces, and the figures included were an Imperial Patrol Trooper. You got two of those with a brand new helmet mold. You also got an Imperial Officer, and you got an Imperial Immigration Officer. Now, the Imperial Immigration Officer is supposed to be the one that kind of keeps Han Solo and Kira from going through the gate at the beginning of the film. It's not a very accurate figure to her appearance in the movie, but she is titled as an Imperial Immigration Officer. The build for this set here was the Imperial Patrol Speeder, and this is actually a really accurate build to the speeder that we see in the movie. It looks a lot like the thing seen in the film, and this is weird. Most of the time with battle packs, LEGO just makes something up, man. They just make up a vehicle. For this one, they actually based it off something that appears in the movie. So this served as a battle pack, but also just served as a pretty solid small set of getting a vehicle that is seen in the film, which I really appreciate making this actually a really good small set. And they don't really make, you know, $15 size LEGO sets anymore. So it's a breath of fresh air to see a set kind of like that, even though it did have the battle pack logo and all that you know kind of like title it still was different enough and I do like that about this set the next set from the line for thirty dollars and three hundred and forty five pieces is Han Solo's land speeder this set included Han Solo an exclusive variant wearing his white kind of camouflage vest from Corellia that was a really cool variant of the figure to get and all the Han Solo figures in this wave used the relatively new at the time Han Solo hairpiece with the part in the middle very cool hairpiece also in this set you got Kira, the first version of her we're going to see. This is Amelia Clark, the actress from Game of Thrones. who plays Daenerys in Game of Thrones. This was her character, and she had a nice, brand new, shorter hair piece that looked really cool. And you also got a Corellian Hound here, who we'll also see in the next set from this line, which was one weird-looking piece they made for that creature from the movie. The build of this set, you only got one build, and that was Han Solo's speeder. It's a dark blue speeder with some white accents. Two seats towards the back, really Really great interior. They had lots of controls. There's like a throttle, all these controls. The seats are really well built up. And there was a lot of storage space on this thing as well. You could lift off the entire hood to store some spring loaded launchers to activate the extra ones if, because there were ones on the bottom of this speeder. There was like some engine detail space to store their weapons as well. And at the back, you could pull out a small little crate to store what was supposed to be hyperfuel fuel coaxium. Sorry, that's a hard word to say. Quiac coaxium? Quiac Coaxium, coaxium, coaxium. It's a hard word to say, and I'm probably gonna mess it up more throughout this review. And additionally, this thing also had wheels 
on the bottom so it looked like it was hovering and you could roll it around for playability. This was a fantastic set, a seriously great set. It's really accurate to the film. It has a great design. It was a good price for piece all around a fantastic set. For $40 with 464 pieces, another good price per piece is Moloch's Land Speeder. The figures included with this set were Moloch, who is an alien from the film, and this was, I believe, the first LEGO set to feature the new dress piece. Before, LEGO just used a simple slope piece as a dress piece, but this was a brand new dress piece that's the same length as the normal minifig legs before characters that wore dresses were actually a little bit taller because the slope piece wasn't the same size as minifig legs, and it has the normal LEGO minifig attached attachment to their legs. So a new dress piece for Moloch. You also got his psychic character Rebolt holding a black Indiana Jones whip. And you got two Corellian Hounds, the same piece that we saw in the last set. The build of this set here was just Moloch Speeder, a really big ugly gray speeder that had a six stud shooter towards the front. It also had like a cage for the Corellian Hounds, which is accurate to what we saw in the film. There was a cockpit for Moloch that was really deep, so you could put Moloch in there even with his dress piece and his ability to not be able to sit down because he had a dress piece on. And there was storage in the back. You could pull out a little thing that had storage for some weapons and some bones for the Corellian Hounds. And this one also had wheels on the bottom so it could chase around Han Solo speeder. And speaking of chasing around, you had this set, the Han Solo speeder set, and the battle pack set. You could now recreate the Corellia speeder chase from the beginning of the movie. All three of these sets kind of went together to make a not super expensive, would have been what, $85 total little chase scene. I think that's really cool. All these sets were pretty good values. They had good figures, good playability, and they looked like the vehicles from the movie. Very respectable sets to kick off this line of solo toys. Now, the next set is the Imperial TIE Fighter. This was a $70 set with 519 pieces. Big oof on the price or piece right there. The figures in this set were great. You got a simple TIE Fighter pilot, which is expected. You got a Mimban Stormtrooper that actually had a new helmet mold. Very cool looking Stormtrooper. It's kind of gray and has camouflage. You also got Han Solo in his Mud Trooper disguise. He had a very nice looking helmet piece with goggles on the top. I wish you had a variant where you could actually put his goggles down, but it still looked very cool, and he had a cool piece on the back for his cape that Man Band Stormtrooper also used, and you also got Tobias Beckett, Woody Harrelson's character from the film, in his Imperial disguise from Mibban. Great selection of figures for what otherwise is literally just a TIE Fighter. Now, TIE Fighters are great. I love TIE Fighters, and I think LEGO should always try to strive to have some form of TIE Fighter on the market, but at the same time, I have lots of TIE Fighters. I get like a new LEGO TIE Fighter every year, it seems. So it wasn't super exciting to get a new TIE Fighter set, but the design of this set was really good. And it's the first time I got the classic Imperial TIE Fighter from the original trilogy with the new TIE Fighter cockpit piece they released in 2015 to coincide with the sets from The Force Awakens and Star Wars Rebels. So good set overall. It's just a little bit boring, and it's the only set from this line that was something that was just like not new whatsoever. Speaking of not really being new, the biggest set from this line, of course, is the Kessel Run Millennium Falcon. Now, the Millennium Falcon has been drilled into the ground. Lego released one in 2019. The Kessel Run version I'm talking about came out in 2018. The UCS version came out in 2017. A version from The Force Awakens came out in 2015. Since they started making sets based off the new Disney era Star Wars, they had made so many Millennium Falcons, and it's getting very repetitive, and I sincerely hope they don't make another one for at least a few years now. But the Kessel Run Millennium Falcon is a bit different, and we'll talk about why in just a second, but first, First, of course, the price was a big oof, 170 bucks. Ugh, that is that is not a good price. The last Millennium Falcon from Force Awakens just three years prior was 150, so that price jump was definitely not ideal. This set had 1,414 pieces, nice piece count, but not great, great of a piece count for a $170 set. This set though had a fantastic 
lineup of minifigures. You got Han Solo in his brown jacket. This was an exclusive variant to this set. This is kind of the outfit that he was known for from the film, so definitely a desirable version of the character to get. There was Chewbacca included with this set, which I believe is the only figure in this set that's not exclusive. Well, actually, it might have been. No, it is an exclusive Chewbacca. He actually had a brand new mold because he had two different bandoliers. I'm sorry, I messed it up. Chewbacca was different and exclusive to this set. You also got Kira in a different outfit and a different hairpiece, who was exclusive to this set. She was actually used a rubbery Lego Friends hairpiece, which is interesting. You got Donald Glover's Lando Calrissian. Young Lando was completely exclusive to this set. Lego loves putting Lando in hard to get Lego sets for some reason. He is always seems to be in expensive ones like the episode nine version of Lando only came in the Millennium Falcon as well. You also got Quay Tulsite, who was one of the people from the crime syndicate on Kessel. Very cool looking figure with a brand new mold for his helmet. He had a very interesting gold print face underneath his helmet you got a Kessel operations droid that was just kind of a red droid and then you got DD BD which was a kind of astromech gonk droid looking combination that used the Lego Ninjago skeleton leg pieces in a different color which is a very interesting figure all of these figures though were fantastic great designs great details pretty much all exclusive to this set awesome figure lineup and of course the build is the Kessel Run Millennium Falcon itself. And this Falcon is different from the versions we see in other movies simply because it is white and blue. It's supposed to be Lando's pristine Millennium Falcon with a new paint job. It's like the pristine Falcon. It's the brand new Falcon. It's supposed to look different from the versions from the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy, which is like the rundown Falcon. And it also still features the escape pod at the front. That's obviously a little plot point in the movie when they're being kind of pulled into that gravity well. They have to launch the escape pod off, which explains why the Falcon's front looks like it does in the original trilogy. And it's a pretty cool design but it's the same design that had been used for the 2015 version and the 2011 version that was introduced with the 2004 version of the Millennium Falcon where it has the like pizza slice, what people call them, the pizza slice panels that fold up on the top of the Falcon to reveal the interior and it makes for a lot of gaps at the top of this ship. So it's a design that was pretty good that LEGO did actually change with the 2019 Falcon, thankfully, but at the same time, it was still a cool thing. It was still a cool set to get and this set was voted on by my fans on Instagram as the best set from Solo, A Star Wars Story. Not really surprised it was voted as the best set because it's the biggest set. People love getting the biggest thing from the movie. And it's a cool set, and I do enjoy having this set. I had a lot of fun building this set. And I remember, it's just a bad price. It was a really bad price and definitely not, I didn't feel comfortable spending 170 bucks on a Kessel Run Millennium Falcon, but it was still a good set that came with a fantastic selection of minifigures. So that's it for the initial wave of Solo A Star Wars Story sets, but there actually was a follow-up wave just a few months later in August of 2018 when the normal kind of summer sets come out for LEGO Star Wars, and three new Solo sets were released in that wave. The first of those being the $30, 355-piece Cloud Rider Swoop Bike set. The figures included with this set were Infy's Nest, a very interesting character from the film with a brand new helmet mold. You also got the Psychic Infy nest played by Warwick Davis in the film Weasel. Very interesting character as well who's supposed to be the same character Warwick Davis played in The Phantom Menace just kind of tying those two movies together. And you also got Tobias Beckett, Woody Harrelson's character. This time was his normal outfit he wears in the movie, not the Imperial Disguise we saw in the TIE Fighter set. The builds of this set, which there are two builds of this set, were two separate speeders. Emphis Ness had a speeder that was long and had a big fin at the back in one seat for that character. They had a really cool color scheme of kind of grays, tans, blacks, and dark reds. It looked like a very cool color scheme for these speeders. And then Weasel speeder actually had a sidecar. Very cool looking speeder, even though there was no figure to put in the sidecar, the sidecar still was there, and it was a cool looking speeder bike. Both of these swoop bikes looked very cool. It was a good design, and it was a great value for $30. You couldn't really get much better of a value than this set. The next set, which was not a good value, was the 622-piece Imperial Conveyance Transport that retailed for 90 bucks. And actually, I believe about 70 of the pieces included with that set were treads, which makes the piece count seem even worse. This was a really horrible value. But this set 
was a set that I really wanted to be good, and then I got it, and it just wasn't that good. And it's definitely a disappointing set because it's one of the more memorable parts from the movie. But we'll talk about the figures before we talk about the build here first. The figures included with this set were Han Solo, and this was the version of Han Solo wearing goggles. And you also got Chewbacca wearing goggles printed on the Chewbacca piece. Both really cool exclusive variants of these characters available in just this set. You also got the Imperial Gunner, who literally was not in the movie. This Imperial Gunner does not appear in the film, so kind of a weird inclusion there. And you got two different versions of the Range Trooper, which was kind of like the new marketable Stormtrooper from this movie. It's like a Stormtrooper with a lot of like icy gear on and very heavy magnetic boots so it can kind of stick on the side of the Imperial Convex. Those figures did both look very cool and had a very cool kind of like shoulder pauldron piece and a nice new helmet mold. Now, the build for this set was the Conveyx train. The Conveyx in the movie, I'm not really entirely sure why the Imperials use trains. It's kind of a weird thing. I don't really feel like you need trains when, like, you know, spaceships and speeders exist, but whatever, I digress. They have a train that goes through these icy mountains, and it made for a very cool high sequence in the movie. But the train LEGO designed... It just wasn't accurate, man. It wasn't. It was not a very good design. First off, it's an inaccurate dark gray color. From what I can tell in the movie, that train looked very light gray to me. So I'm not sure why LEGO built it in dark gray. Now the main car, the LEGO version, has these big treads going through it. And the one, the second car that LEGO had, wheels on the bottom so it could roll around. Which is a cool play feature, but in the movie, the train is on tracks. And the tracks are like double-sided. So there's one car on top and kind of one car on the bottom and it kind of goes on these tracks like that. So there's like parallel mirrored versions of the cars in the movie, but the Lego version just came with the top one and not the bottom one. And I'm not sure how they would have designed that and it probably would have had to have been a very expensive set. So I kind of get kind of the decisions they made here, but ultimately it just was not accurate to the film and it doesn't look very good. And it did not help that this was such a bad value. Now, the secondary car had some storage for the coaxium. I think I said it right that time in the back. And you also had some places to put your minifigures and the first car had a cockpit for a couple of figures to drive it, but it was just two sets of cars didn't have the bottom side no tracks or anything had these weird treads that just not seen the movie it was overall i think not a super good design of a cool looking vehicle in the movie and i think it could be a really cool set but lego kind of dropped the ball here Finally, from this second wave for $100 with 829 pieces was the Imperial AT Hauler. I remember I bought this set at Brick Fair 2018 with my friend Austin. I went to Brick Fair with him. Shout out to Austin. Austin's a cool dude and a fan of the show. Love you, man. Now, the figures included with this set were Kira. This version had a fur coat in the same piece we saw, fair piece we saw with the Kessel Run Falcon. We also got Thandy Newton's character, very underutilized character from the movie Val, who had a cool afro piece and we got Jon Favreau's character or his voice character from the movie Rio Durant, the four-armed monkey-like character who had a brand new arm piece that had just two Lego arms in the normal one-arm socket. Very cool arm piece that I hope we might see again on a future Lego figure. The Rio Durant figure was really cool. Another character that was just criminally underutilized in that film. But I love the name of Rio Durant because I'm pretty sure it's a reference to Duran Duran, the popular band from the 1980s British rock band because the band Duran Duran has a song called Rio. So Rio is one of their songs and his last name is Durant, like Kevin Durant or the Pokemon Durant, and it's Duran is Durant just without the T. So I think that's a reference to Duran Duran. I can't confirm that, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. Also included here were two of Dryden's Enforcers who had brand new molds for their heads. Cool looking figures. However, Dryden Voss, the main villain of Solo, played by Paul Bettany, who I thought was actually a pretty cool villain and Paul Bettany gave a good performance in that movie, is not in any Solo set and he was never made into a figure. I really wish LEGO made a poly bag or something for him because we never got this character in LEGO form, which is a big disappointment. Now the builds of this set were, there are a couple builds, the first one of course is the all-terrain hauler, the AT hauler, which is a 
interesting looking vehicle. It does kind of look like an AT-AT head, but it is a spaceship of sorts. And this vehicle was made in white and brown. I think the color white was an interesting choice. I might have liked it better if it were made in light gray, but white wasn't too bad. The brown was definitely accurate. And the vehicle has two arms, and those arms can move up and down, and it had features on the arms with some claws, and it could pick up things. And you actually got a storage crate included with this set for it to pick up. Now in the movie, it doesn't pick up storage crates. It picks up one of the cars full of coaxium from the conveyex, and you actually could do that with this set. You could literally pick up the second car from the aforementioned conveyex set and pick it up with the arms from this set, which is a really cool feature to have kind of intertwining two sets like that. Now in the movie, they use like these ropes to pick it up, so it actually wasn't really a very accurate feature to the way it's done in the film, but I still like the effort from Lego for that. And the arms could also fold up and some landing gears could fold out and you could land this vehicle, which was cool as well. There was a nice little walkway on the bottom Bottom where you could fit figures and Han and Chewbacca actually have a talking scene in the movie down there even though those figures weren't included in the set and this also had a small cockpit which the cockpit was pretty awful you could only fit one minifigure on the inside and had pretty much no detail Lego really dropped the ball on that cockpit but besides that it was a pretty cool set and a pretty good representation of that vehicle from the movie and finally for solo sets there's a couple poly bags I'm not really gonna talk about here, but there were two poly bags that actually came with figures. They're like promotions. One was a Kessel Mine Worker. This worker that had a very like banana-ish yellow colored outfit. Pretty cool looking figure. The other one, I think the cooler of these two was the Han Solo Mud Trooper. Now we did get the Mud Trooper Han in the TIE Fighter set. This though was the version of him literally covered in mud when he's thrown into the pit with Chewbacca. And the figure was in light tan and it had like mud off of it on his face and even his hair color was changed to look like it was covered in mud. This is an awesome figure. I love that figure and it made for a very cool poly bag. So that's it y'all. Those are all the Solo A Star Wars Story Lego sets. I would love to see more stuff from this movie. I'd love to see Dryden Voss's yacht be made into a big set. I'd love to see a remake of the of the Conveyex, but better. However, I don't think we're ever going to see any more sets from Solo A Star Wars Story, which is definitely sad, but just kind of the truth because of how badly this thing bombed. What do you guys think about these? Please tell me in the comments below if you're listening on YouTube or on Instagram, you can comment, shoot me a DM. And if you have any questions about this podcast, you can email me at legolee329 at gmail.com and also go find me online, all those pages I mentioned at the beginning, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, you name it. Go check me out online. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Thank you for three seasons now of Brickology. This third season is going to be great and I have some big stuff planned next week's episode is going to be awesome i have a new podcast coming soon there's seriously some great stuff here happening in the future thank you for the unconditional support of this podcast and for listening to today's episode of brickology i hope to catch you guys next time peace out bye bye